So in the last video, we kind of just did some background work, just some reminders on things. Um, but now we're actually going to get into kind of the meat and potatoes of this unit, right? What I'm talking about in this video, like if nothing else, this video is like really matters a lot. Um, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed when you look at cellular respiration. So really, these are some of the main things. This, this is a really good summary and in, in where you should start when it comes to studying for cellular respiration because it gives us the simplicity. So we have four main steps to cellular respiration. We have glycolysis, the formation of the acetyl-CoA or coenzyme A, the citric acid cycle, also called the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. So those are our four steps. In general, glycolysis is where we are taking our glucose and we're going to split it from a six carbon glucose to a three carbon pyruvate. This happens in the cytoplasm, so it can happen anywhere in the cell basically, and it does not require oxygen yet. So glycolysis can happen with or without oxygen. The next step is we take that pyruvate, right? And we're going to form we're going to join it with acetyl coenzyme A or acetyl CoA. You'll hear me call it acetyl CoA since that's generally how it's known in its shortened form. Um, this is going to be called the transition reaction. This is also anaerobic, so still no oxygen is required. And this happens in the matrix of the mitochondria, which basically means like we're happening all kind of in between, right, the membranes there. And then the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, this is also going to happen in the matrix. Right, so in that inside part of the mitochondria. And we will need some oxygen at this point, a little bit. The main thing though, when it comes to oxygen is at the ETC, um, because oxygen will be the final electron acceptor at the end of the ETC. This is where oxygen really comes in and plays a heavy role. Um, this is what's gonna happen kind of right, it's gonna saddle the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And we'll see some pictures. So if you kind of don't have a visual of what I'm talking about, we'll get there, don't worry. But if you just want a quick overview, just the, the, the quick and dirty basics of cell respiration that's here. So let's go ahead and talk about glycolysis. Now, glycolysis alone, right, is a 10 step process. You are not going to need to memorize all 10 steps because that's brutal and it doesn't really accomplish what we're trying to accomplish here. We want to understand what glycolysis is in general and what are the key points or the key pieces of information, the key details that matter. So let's look at the word glycolysis to start. Glycolysis, glyco, we think glucose, right? Lysis, we've heard, to split. So we are going to split this glucose. And in this 10 step process, we're going to split it from a six carbon glucose into two separate three carbon pyruvic acid or pyruvates. You may see pyruvate too. So we're splitting, right, their six carbon glucose into two three carbon molecules. We're gonna get a net production. So we're gonna get a little bit of ATP. We're gonna get two ATP out of it in terms of what we gain. And we're going to reduce two NAD pluses to NADH. Again, this occurs in the cytoplasm. This is just happening in the fluid there and, and this is, does not require any oxygen yet. So overall, it's not too crazy. Now there is one thing we notice here I want to point out, right, is at the very beginning here, right, we have our glucose and you'll notice two ATP are used, right? Two ATP to two ADP, that means we've used two ATP. So this is also something I want you to note about glycolysis is that we have to use a small amount of ATP to kickstart the process. So when we say we have a net gain of two ATP, that's after we've spent the two. So we spend two, we make four. Overall, that means we've gained two from the process, right? We spend two, we gain four. That's a positive two, right? At the end of it, right? Four minus two. So we, in, if you think of glycolysis, you kind of have to spend money to make money, right? You got to spend a little ATP to really make ATP later down the road. Now we will get more than just the two ATP if we continue down cellular respiration. Um, but, right, I wanted to point that out that we do have to spend some ATP to get started. 
Now, once we've gone through that, right, pyruvic acid is going to then, basically our fate, right, our pyruvate's fate will be determined on whether or not oxygen is available. If oxygen is not available, we're forced to go through fermentation, which will continue through the cytoplasm. But if we do have oxygen available, which is what we're gonna focus on with cellular respiration, then we are able to go through the mitochondria, right? And we can continue through the rest of the process. So one thing you'll notice though, if you're looking at the graph or the picture on, on the right, if we go through fermentation, we get two ATPs. If we go through aerobic respiration, 36 ATPs. Big difference when it comes to the efficiency. The efficiency of aerobic respiration outpaces fermentation by a mile. Now that doesn't mean fermentation is useless. It's fantastic if you need a little ATP right now. It's very fast. Aerobic respiration has a lot more steps involved as we'll find out in just a minute. But it's things to think about. Um, so if oxygen is plentiful, pyruvic acid will be converted to that acetyl-CoA, right? We'll go from acetyl-CoA, we'll enter the Krebs cycle, right? We'll be able to continue through the process. But if there is no oxygen for whatever reason, then we go through and we produce lactic acid, right? Instead, we go through fermentation. And basically, this just is basically, are we going to reduce or are we going to oxidize pyruvate? That's all this is, right? If oxygen's available or absent, we're just deciding, do we oxidize pyruvate or do we reduce it? So let's quickly talk about the lactic acid pathway really fast. Um, this is just, again, a brief, you need it right now type thing, right? So your skeletal muscles can survive on this briefly using lactic acid fermentation, right? And, and you've, pro you've definitely used this before. If you've ever had to do a sprint, right, or any sort of activity that requires a lot of energy in a very short period of time, the lactic acid pathway is just fine, right, but you'll notice you can't keep that up forever, right, you cannot continue sprinting for an entire mile, right, you have to slow down or you have to stop, and you'll notice you feel that burning in your legs, right, that's from that buildup of that lactic acid, that lactate, so we have to remove that excessive lactic acid to prevent lactic acidosis. Basically, we go through the Cori cycle where we take that, we transport it to the liver, we then convert it into pyruvic acid, and then we can go back kind of to the start, right? So there, we can kind of recycle it, right? We got our two ATP, but we're gonna have to put some ATP back in to be able to get us back to pyruvate, right? Um, so Again, lactic acid pathway is perfectly fine when you need a quick burst of ATP um, for a short period of time, but you know, if you are, you're not gonna be able to do it forever. You're gonna have to stop because that lactic acid will build up and, and you'll feel it, right? You feel that burning, you feel that pain when you sprint and you've reached the, your limit, right? That's the lactic acid pathway kind of reaching its peak, reaching its end right, where you have to slow down or you have to stop, and then you will take that pyruvate and convert it back, or you'll take that lactic acid, I'm sorry, and convert it back. So we're saying oxygen is here though, right? So we have our, our acetyl-CoA, we are going to then take our pyruvic acid, break it down into the acetyl group. So this is the transition, we have our pyruvate, we're then going to join it with our coenzyme A to form acetyl-CoA. And you'll notice we get a little bit of waste, but we've also collected a little bit of, we are, I should say not collect, I guess you say collected a little, a few um, electrons by reducing NAD plus to NADH. And if you look at where we're going with this, right, we've gone in, we've gone from the cytosol into the inner side of the mitochondrion. So we're, we're inside the mitochondria at this point. When we say mitochondrial matrix, we mean like deep in it, in the middle. Now that we have acetyl-CoA, 
we can enter into the Krebs cycle. So we call it a cycle because things are going to be recycled, right? This is an eight step process. And again, do not look at this picture and go, oh no, I have to remember citrate to isocitrate to ketoglutarate. No, 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 no. I'm not worried about that. All I'm worried about with here, with the Krebs cycle, is understanding that acetyl-CoA comes in, we go through this eight step process, and that at multiple points, right, as we go through these eight, eight steps, we are going to be harvesting electrons, right, reducing NAD plus to NADH, as well as FAD to FADH2, and that the end product we get, right, returns. So when we come in, acetyl-CoA comes in, it joins together with oxaloacetate, right? These two come together, acetyl-CoA, which came from the pyruvate that we just, we had, is going to join with oxaloacetate. Together they form citrate. We go through the rest of the steps. We harvest those electrons. We reduce our electron carriers, right? We get a little bit of ATP. We produce some of that carbon dioxide. But at the very end, we go back to oxaloacetate. So this is why it's cyclical, because this oxaloacetate joins with acetyl-CoA, and by the time we get around, we're back to oxaloacetate to join up with another acetyl-CoA. So we can keep using the same oxaloacetate over and over and over and over and over again. So kind of cool to, to think about how, how the, this system is made to, to reduce waste, basically, right? That we have reusable components to it. So the things you need to remember again are these bullet points here for the most part. The ones I'm really worried about are these ones about the NAD plus being reduced to NADH and FAD reduced to FADH2, and then we're getting ATP. All right, those things are the things that matter. And of course, getting some carbon dioxide waste, right? Some carbon dioxide will be produced in this as well. So again, the key thing here, the main job of the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle is we're gonna oxidize the rest of those carbon-carbon bonds and we are stripping off electrons, right? We are shuttling them using NAD+, plus, right? Shuttling them to the ETC for later. We're getting a little bit of ATP, we're producing some CO2 waste, but the big thing is we're harvesting electrons. And so you'll notice both glycolysis and the Krebs cycle kind of have a similar goal. Both of them do not produce a lot of ATP, they make a little. But the main goal of glycolysis in the Krebs cycle is to strip those electrons and shuttle them to the ETC because the ETC is where the money is going to be made. That's where we're really doing our investment. So think of like right now glycolysis and the Krebs cycle as investment steps where we're taking these electrons to invest down the line. And then we get to the ETC where we can actually put them to use to make money, right? Make the thing we need to make. So the ETC, which is the electron transport chain, if you haven't uh, caught that, I'm gonna call it ETC the entire way from here on out because it's shorter. The ETC is a series of reactions that happens on the inner mitochondrial membrane. So remember that the mitochondria have two membranes this is going to be saddling that inner membrane. So it's going to happen, what's going on with the ETC happens through that membrane. This is oxidative phosphorylation because we're using oxygen as a final electron acceptor here to indirectly basically go from ADP to ATP. Right. We're going to reduce the oxygen to water because oxygen is that final electron acceptor and remember that those electrons are coming with hydrogen. From this whole process, we're also going to be basically producing a, um, a gradient, a concentration gradient of hydrogen ions, basically forcing one side of the membrane to have a, a, an abnormally high amount of hydrogen ions on it which are then going to want to move from the high concentration to the low concentration side and that movement, that active transport or pumping of the hydrogen onto one side to force the high concentration is called chemiosmosis. We're going to create this really high 
concentration of hydrogen ions on one side because they will, they will want to move from high to low. So what's going on here? So let's, here's our picture, right? We have our, our ETC, right? Which is simplified down. There's a lot of moving parts to it, but this is just, you know, the, the curtain, right? Don't, well, don't look behind the curtain. Um, but this is all, the, all those reactions together being demonstrated here, right? And so what we see is that the energy from here, these electrons are gonna move down the chain and in the process we can pump some of those hydrogen ions into that inner that that in between space between the two membranes. So we're forcing this space here to have a really high hydrogen ion concentration. We're forcing that to happen. And so then if we have a really high hydrogen ion concentration here and it's low on the other side, naturally things want to go from high to low. And so we have a pathway for those hydrogen ions to go through from the high side to the low side and in the process as they pass through they're actually going to help turn this enzyme called ATP synthase which then produces ATP it snaps that phosphate basically right back on so we're forcing hydrogen ions on one side we give them a channel to go through and inadvertently as they move through the channel it allows us to reproduce ATP it's kind of ingenious when you think of it. That's, that's really cool, right? When you think about how it, it works on a basic level. This is the money-making step too, where most of the ATP, remember we've only, we've only gotten about four of them per glucose molecule in glycolysis and, um, and, and the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. So we've gotten very little ATP, but we're gonna get like about 30 or so ATP from the ETC alone. So we're, we're literally getting seven, eight times the amount of ATP in this step compared to glycolysis and the Krebs cycle combined. Like I said, money-making step. So why do we call it a chain? Now, I don't expect you to remember the, the details here, right? but we want to at least understand what's going on. So we call it a chain because there's multiple carrier molecule, you know, there's multiple carrier molecules all in a row, right? Here we have one, two, three, and four, and cytochrome C. So we have this chain of these proteins all in a line, right? One, two, three, four, Q, and site C, which is cytochrome C. They're all along that inner membrane, and they're going to transfer, right, electrons. We see that we're transferring the electrons, right? We're stripping that hydrogen ion and transferring those electrons as well as some protons into the, into the inner membrane space. So we're stripping the electrons. The electrons get passed from this to the next to the next to the next, right? They're going to go down the chain. So we have our electrons literally going from one to two to three, right? All the way down. Whereas the protons are being pumped into that inner membrane space to create that super high concentration. Again, I'm not worried about the, the, the nitty gritty, so don't worry about memorizing the numbers and cytochrome C and all that kind of stuff. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about you understanding the basic concept that these electrons will be passed from each carrier down the line, and as they do that, they lose their energy. They go from a high energy state to a low energy state, and that we're using this to also create that really high, that like artificially high proton gradient. So if we compare it, right? Um, glycolysis, we get about two ATP. We don't get any ATP from acetyl-CoA formation. We get some from the citric acid cycle. But when we look at the ATP we get from the electron transport chain, we're getting 32 or so ATP, right? So pretty impressive when you, when you think about that. Now, the ETC doesn't do this by itself, right? It uses materials brought to it by the citric acid cycle, brought to it by glycolysis, right, in the acetyl-CoA formation. So we're getting the, you know, supplies from the other steps. But it really shows you kind of like where the moneymaker is and why the other steps have to exist, even though they don't produce a lot of ATP directly.